So thanks everyone for joining us to for today's VMware Horizon Apps and User Experience Workshop. Um, you know, when we talk about Horizon, I do want to take just a moment to kind of level set. We do have a Horizon 101 workshop. If uh, you're unfamiliar with Horizon or how it's architected and how you know it can be configured, we do have that available for replay on our YouTube channel. So I uh, would love for you to take a look at that. But first place is I will start with a brief recap of Horizon and uh, what we can do with the Horizon system. So uh, VMware Horizon started out its life as a product called VMware View. Uh, it's a platform for managing and delivering virtualized or hosted desktops and applications to end users. So uh, the applications run in a data center close to the data, close to the application servers, and basically all that gets delivered out to the user is the screens. Um, two different modes of delivering applications and desktops. Um, those are a little bit self-explanatory. Applications displays the application without a um, start bar, without the control panel, all of the normal desktop elements. And a published desktop is going to deliver the full experience. So you get the desktop, you get the start bar, you can run multiple applications. Um, the application mode is really useful cross-platform for clients like Linux or Mac where they can't run Windows applications. Uh, you can deliver an application, make it seamless. Uh, that's a lot how I work on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, I work in Excel uh, an awful lot and Excel for Mac, not a great thing. So I use uh, Horizon to deliver Excel for Windows to my Mac. And uh, that's the way I get the job done. Just uh, uh, one of those things that doesn't work as well on another operating system. So uh, this is a technology that we focus on uh, from a Zintegra perspective. Um, Horizon helps you create and broker connections to you know, all of your different Windows virtual desktops, remote desktop servers, and it can also deliver Linux virtual desktops and Linux hosted applications. You might ask, what you know? How often does that come up? You know, it comes up a lot in some of the industrial settings. Uh, sometimes in telecom, uh, they have Linux applications for you know cable head ends and things like that. So, uh, Horizon is capable of doing both Linux and Windows, uh, and so that's a great uh, benefit for everyone. In addition to it, um, you can also access everything published in Horizon through an HTML5 browser. So that means non-traditional endpoints like Chromebooks, uh, iPads, tablets that can't run uh, maybe a native client or where they don't want to run a native client. You can publish all of these resources into a browser. And so from a web portal like the one shown here on screen, uh, you can launch your application. Uh, you get things like single sign-on uh, to make the user experience frictionless for your users. And uh, all of those things get delivered uh, to whatever the endpoint of choice is for your user. A lot of companies use technology like Horizon uh, for offshore workers, uh, contractors, folks where they're maybe not issuing a, a desktop, as well as um, you know, have engineering customers where they need GPUs and gobs of RAM and they need to be as close as possible to the data that they're working with. So I have lots of engineers uh, who run big uh, modeling software, you know, graphic intensive uh, CAD design type software all from a Horizon environment because they're able to tap into the raw power and be just as close as possible to the data they're working with. So Horizon can solve a multitude of different uh, problems. And so this is the, the basis on which we're gonna talk about your app experience and uh, driving good um, user experience in general. So let's talk about driving good user experience. What is user experience? And so I go to the dictionary and uh, pull out the definition. It's the overall experience of a person using a product as a, such as a website or a computer applications, especially in terms of how easy or pleasing it is to use. So 
I'll tell you a little story. User experience is something my prior organization cared an awful lot about. So uh, we deployed a, a digital experience platform, something that could monitor and help us look at the overall user experience, collect some objective feedback about how things are running, how are users uh, application and experience performing. You know, it could be how much latency is going on for their connection. Are they having crashes? Are they having, um, you know, problems and slowdown? Is something in the environment making uh, and contributing to a bad experience for them? You know, before that, we had to rely on help desk calls. And so we didn't know that there was a bad user experience happening until someone logged a ticket. And we found that to be very um, uh, frustrating for our users, I guess is the right word, as well as it wasn't efficient in terms of finding things and being able to fix things. Once we deployed a software that was watching how things were working and kind of rating and scoring what the user experience looked out looked like for our users, we were able to go in and start making some adjustments. Uh, that was adjustments in the software itself, adjustments with, uh, you know, latency from certain offices, you know, certain branches that that may have had worse internet connection, or maybe we should prefer a different provider, uh, an internet provider at that location. But it helped us become more proactive. We could also search out common problems we were getting tickets for before they happened. Good example the OST files inside of Outlook. You know, we were getting tons of cases around those uh, filling up and then users getting errors. Well, we knew what the size limit was. We knew when that error was coming. So we just needed software to basically go out and look at it and figure out, you know, and let us know before we got into that situation. So we were able to script ways to remediate that before the user even knew they were on the edge of the cliff, ready to fall off. So user experience is, is all about pleasing the end user. There's a lot that goes into this, and there's a lot that, that really um, is more art than science when it comes to creating a strategy for good user experience. So to drive good user experience, something that's pleasing to the user, well, what does the user actually care about? Uh, you know, came up with these five points. Technology that is easy to understand and use. You know, intuitive comes to mind. Something where you don't need a training class to really understand how to get in and make it work. Performance is a huge, huge thing users care about. They may not be able to articulate it in that word. They may not be able to tell you that they're having performance problems, but performance matters. The, the way that you'll hear it translated from a user is this is slow or this is not working well. Uh, technology with minimal problems, glitches, crashes, uh, driver conflicts. Uh, there's all sorts of things that contribute to uh, a minimal problem uh, kind of, well, contribute to all of the help desk cases you get. Uh, but yes, at the end of the day, you want the fewest possible problems that you can. Uh, users also just care about getting to what they need when they need it. So availability is a huge, huge part of this. And at the end of the day, our users, our coworkers, they care most about just getting their job done. Those are the things that go into good user experience. And so to sum that up, Intuitive, performant, resilient, and available. Those are the key concepts we're going to talk about today and focus on from a user experience standpoint. User experience is important, but delivering good user experience is also about making sure that your operations is also optimized. So you can't deliver great user experience if you have a complicated, difficult, time, you know, operating the delivery technology that you're using, in this case, Horizon. So uh, one of the first places that we're going to focus in on is app delivery. Um, you know, many of our customers, most of the folks that have worked in the EUC space, 
we have had this traditional way of deploying applications. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the complicating factors. Uh, and, and one of those is that Windows desktop operating systems were designed for one-to-one -one use. That's how Microsoft laid out the operating system to work like a home PC. Uh, and we've done things to change that when we start to move Windows desktops into Horizon. Now you have users who may be sharing this operating system. So you get problems like profile bloat, profile locality, you know, user A has logged into system A, but then user B logs into system A. Both of their profiles live just on that operating system. Now, when user A logs into system C, they don't have a profile again. So we have to figure out how do we separate things like their user data, settings, all of those things into uh, you know, a package or a container that is portable and moves from desktop to desktop when they need it to. So profile management is a huge thing we talk about here. Um, we also have applications and applications because it's software have to have patches. So how do you manage those patches? How do you get them out there? How do you test them? Uh, traditionally, we've packaged all of that stuff into a master image and using the Horizon technology of linked clones or uh, you know, instant clones, uh, we've been able to create multiple copies of the operating system, push it out in front of our users, and that's how we scale. Uh, but every time one of those applications needs to be updated, we have to break open that master image, perform our patches, then perform testing, and then push it out. It's a cumbersome process. And there is a better way. And we'll talk about that. Uh, the better way is actually a part of the Horizon portfolio called App Volumes. We'll focus on that here in just a few minutes. And lastly, uh, you know, the user experience needs to be one that can understand. So when they get to the desktop, it needs to work and act like a desktop. It can't have you know, a ton of different changes that make it different from what a user is accustomed to on their desktop. So creating something that's almost transparent in the delivery is very important. So having their profile follow them, having their user data available to them, no matter where they log in, is a huge part of driving great user experience as well. So where are the challenges for app and desktop delivery? Well, we talked about one on the previous slide, native. Windows OS is built to be a persistent experience. So to combat that, we need to break apart the user data and break apart the user profile and store those in other places so that uh, you get that persistent experience no matter where the user logs in. Uh, applications that are installed locally can conflict. You, know, you can't have two versions of Microsoft Office. You can't have Office 2013 and Office 2016 installed on the same system. So handling those is traditionally done by publishing multiple different farms. Well, every time you add a new image, every time you add a new farm, you've got additional overhead to maintain from an operational standpoint. That's not ideal. Natively, users log into different teams, uh, different machines every time they start. So um, you know, again, you know, breaking apart the user profile, user data, you know, it's it's a big part of it. Microsoft has some native solutions, roaming profiles, folder redirection, and FS logics. Uh, there are also third-party solutions that help you with that profile and user data. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, VMware solution, which is uh, DEM or Dynamic Environment Manager. Uh, that also helps you break apart and store pieces of the profile uh, and make it portable across any system that your user logs into. You know, every user in the org may need different programs. So when you package everything into your base image, now you've got increased chances of bloat, well, increased chances of conflict, you've got bloat, um, you've got all sorts of regression testing problems. So we're going to advocate a different way, a simpler way 
that you can handle your app mix. So what's that better way? You know, server admins manage a single golden master image for each OS. We advocate that it's, it's a reality. We can do that. And we keep that as thin as possible, just your operating system and things like your antivirus agents and any other kernel mode type software that has to be there, mostly agents. Uh, then we layer on the applications. You know, what's great about uh, layering on the applications as a separate package is that you get the benefit of targeting what apps an individual user needs. So you get a very tailored custom and, you know, experience for the user and you don't have to have any trade-offs. You've not turned, you know, uh, your image management into managing 100 images with different mixes of applications. You've also not published apps that a user doesn't need access to, uh, which could lead to security risks uh, or could lead to just, you know, conflict like we were talking about earlier. Users get just what they need delivered to them, and then their data and settings follow them to any machine. This is the best way. And what's great about what we're talking about today is although we're talking about it in the context of Horizon, the technologies that we're talking about also work with Citrix. They also work with Parallels. They work with just about any uh, virtual app and desktop platform out there, uh, including some of the hyperscale environments like AVD, and um, workspaces or workspaces core from AWS. So what does that modern model look like? Well, we start with that clean base OS image. Now we add only the agents to the base image. Then we package our applications independent of the OS, and then we abstract the user data and profiles. That's the Nirvana state. That's what we're after today. So let's talk a little bit about that packaging of apps. So traditionally, uh, you would have the apps installed natively on the operating system. But what you see here is we've created uh, a different image, an image with just the app volumes agent living on the base image. That means you only crack the image to do Windows updates maybe once a month. Uh, those can be versioned you know, with snapshots so you can roll back and roll forward. Uh, with your testing. And then each of the applications can be its own package, or you can create a package with multiple of the applications that need to live together. Uh, an example from my previous world, I was working in insurance. We had a line of business application where we stored documents. That doc management system also wanted to open both Adobe Acrobat and also office applications so that you could make changes and edit those documents once they were in the imaging system. So in our case, what we did was we actually packaged uh, office separate and delivered it every time to every user as a base enablement. And then we packaged Adobe uh, Acrobat Reader, excuse me, Acrobat Editor, and the imaging application into their own image together because they went hand in hand and we needed those two to be there. We were fortunate in the fact that only users of that application needed full-blown Acrobat, which also helped us eliminate putting and licensing Acrobat Editor for all of our users. We were able to cut that down to just a couple hundred licenses and we were able to save because we were able to target it directly without any additional overhead to the technology team. From what I've seen, from what I've experienced, a lot of choices are made because it takes the burden off of the operations team. So it's easier to put Adobe uh, Editor into every image and just push it out for everyone and license everyone, but that's a costly workaround. And so in this model, you're able to use Active Directory groups to target applications to specific users. You can be assured that those users are getting the application and license them appropriately. So uh, in addition to the operational advantages, there may be financial advantages for using this model as well. So the app layer is using a technology called App Volumes, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. That'll be the first place. But if you notice, the profile and settings are also managed by DEM or Dynamic Environment Manager. That's also part of the Horizon Suite. And we'll talk about that later in today's workshop. 
So at this point, we're up to at volumes. I've talked for a few minutes. Are there any questions or any comments back about the strategy and what we're talking about today? Anything that I can help you with? All right, if there are no questions, I'll continue to watch the Q&A and webinar chat. Just you can pop them in there or feel free to take yourself off mute, but we'll keep going. So let's talk a little bit about VMware app volumes. Uh, this is a technology that I really love. Um, you know, we, we have been chasing this problem for uh, decades in the EUC space. You know, ever since we started delivering things over a remote desktop or Citrix, um, we've been chasing this nirvana state of packaging apps, making them portable, uh, and taking the administration burden off of our EUC teams. Uh, app volumes finally delivers something that is very, very close to this. You know, every major vendor has a flavor of this. You know, Microsoft has App V um, that I've tried. There's a lot of infrastructure that comes along with creating App V packages and managing and, and delivering them. Uh, it also is a, a state where not all applications can be converted into the App V format. Um, Citrix bought a company called Unidesk years ago, and they came up with app layers. Uh, it also seems to fall short. Uh, today, there's two really big ones, uh, and that's VMware App Volumes, which we'll talk about, and a company called Liquidware Flex App. So both of those companies tout that they get around 95 mm -hmm. to 96% of all applications can be packaged and delivered through their technology. Um, that's a huge percentage and going that high as opposed to the other methods where you could maybe get 80% of your applications. This is a huge win for your IT departments, your EUC teams. So let's talk a little bit about app volumes. So first of all, what platforms do we support? I mentioned this, kind of let the cat out of the bag already. Uh, but you support Horizon natively, Citrix virtual apps and desktops, Citrix DAS, so the cloud version of Citrix as well, Microsoft AVD. And then over the last few weeks uh, at VMware Explore, we talked more about uh, you know, additional places where app volumes can play. So they now play with workspaces uh, uh, through app stacks in AWS and remote apps inside of uh, Microsoft Azure. So in addition to Azure Virtual Desktops, now you can also do just app delivery using the remote app technology from Azure Cloud. So <clears throat> wide support is a great thing. Now let's talk a little bit about how app volumes actually look. So the key concepts to cover here is that you have a hierarchy of different things that make up an app volume. So app volumes are stored as virtual disks. They connect to your hypervisor or to your uh, virtual machine. Uh, app volumes is for virtual machines only uh, today. Uh, there is some talk that uh, maybe app volumes will come to physical desktops in the future, but for today, they are virtual only. So your app volumes are stored either as a VHD, which is a, a Microsoft virtual hard drive format, or a VMDK, which is VMware's virtual disk format. Uh, anyone who's running vSphere, you're probably you know, accustomed to VMDK for your virtual hard drives. Uh, app volumes will store in either of those two formats. So what's great about app volumes is it gives you a workflow that helps you to update and publish changes and revisions to your software. Uh, to do that, you have to understand these, these three layers. So when you talk about app volumes, there's the concept of an application. That's the big bubble. The application is a record inside of app volumes manager that identifies what we're publishing and an application doesn't necessarily have to be one application. It could be something like Microsoft Office Suite. Uh, it could be a particular um, 
set of applications, like I mentioned, my imaging application plus my PDF editor. Um, it could be uh, a single application, a single utility that uh, you know is only occasionally used. So the application is just that bigger placeholder. It's the definition, and that's also where you're going to entitle your users and groups to the application. The key concept here is an application persists over time, meaning you're going to create a Microsoft Office application and then Office uh, 2016, you know, and I'll go back to older. So let's say 2013 is the application. You'll create a package when Service Pack 1 comes out. You'll create a package when Service Pack 2 comes out. Uh, and But the application is still Microsoft Office 2013. So over time, that application doesn't change. That's the point where you're going to entitle your users and groups so that they're always getting the latest. And we'll talk about that latest flag a little bit during the demo, but the latest version of that application. Well, the latest version of that application is something called a package. Applications are installed inside of a package. That's what becomes the VHD or the VMDK. And that's going to have all the files, settings, registry entries, everything that is captured during the packaging process. Packages are a point in time thing. So as we talked about, you'll have a base package, then you'll pack, you, you'll patch it for the next version, the next service pack or the next version release of the, the application. And then you'll package it again when the next update comes out and the next update. So packages are point in time references of a group of programs. Program is gonna be that individual executable that runs inside of Windows. Um, you know, you do see the programs inside of the app volumes manager. Uh, you're able to see, you know, what is part of the package and create icons and things that then appear in the user environment when this application is targeted out to a particular user or computer or group. The last thing to understand is that marker. So I mentioned that app volumes has the ability to workflow your application updates over time. So it does that by creating a, a release. And so there is a marker in the system called current. That is gonna be your latest release or the one that's for wide distribution. And so what most administrators do is they will take an application and that marker, that current marker, and that's the version that gets entitled to all the users. You may have a different group that you want to entitle for testing the next version. So while you're in wide release, you create an update to your package. You create a new package with that update. Now you can target that out to a select number of users and have them perform acceptance testing. Do any of your automated testing uh, with bots or with other systems uh, or simply just get users in it to, to validate that everything works as it's expected to. So the marker technology is really great in terms of being able to test and roll out safely across your entire IT organization. So a little different representation. Um, <clears throat> here we've got the open office application. And as you can see, we've created open office version 4.1.0 as a package. Inside of it, it's got writer and calc probably has a few other programs in there too, but with simplified view here for today. Um, what happens is uh, you create that package. We mark it as current. We entitle uh, the you know entire office users to this application on the current version. And so today the current version is gonna sit here on version 4.1.0. What will end up happening is a release comes out, version 4.1.13. Well, now we've updated that. So we've created a new package. Well, we can take and target that particular version to a group of test users, have them perform testing, everyone signs off. All you need to do is simply go back into the app volumes, go to the 4.1.13 package, and then mark it as current a simple checkbox, a simple operation. And now next time every user logs in, they're gonna get the patched version across your fleet. Now say 
4.1.13 has some serious bug in it and you need to roll back. Well, the beauty of this is you're not going back to snapshots. You're not going back to your master image. You can simply go back to the app volumes console, click on 410, click current on it. And now everyone who logs in from that point forward goes back to the previous version. It makes rollback extremely simple. So app volumes workflow. You create the application and you assign it to the inter, uh, intended users. Then inside of the application, you create a package. And from there, uh, once the package is created, there's a button. Uh, you press the button and you choose a system to use as a packager. Uh, we recommend that it's a clean system similar to your base image, but not your base image. Um, we also recommend that you take a snapshot of it as a reversion point. So after the process is done, you're going to want to revert to that snapshot. So uh, you choose the application. It launches a desktop. From the desktop, you see the app volume agent is waiting and listening and watching the changes on the machine. You can install any kind of application, no matter if it's an install shield, an MSI, um, you know, no matter how old or new. You install the application. Once you've begun the process, once you finish that, you click a button to signal that you've completed. And so the system goes through and it looks at all the changes in the machine. It creates them and rolls them into the package, and then it's ready for testing. So once the package is there, you entitle it out, you do your testing on it, uh, you make any adjustments you need to the package, repackage it, and then uh, you can push it into production. So again, easy to push into production. You go in, you make it the current version of the application, the current package of the application, and then users get it wide in your environment. Last but not least, when patches come out, you create an update package. That's also a workflow. So you can take the existing package that's your latest and current. You can click a button to update it, and uh, it will begin the capture process again. And so you install incremental changes, you uninstall and reinstall the application, whatever the process is, it workflows it for you. And as you can see, we've got some little green happy app admins at the end of this process. So let's talk a little bit about app volumes and its logical architecture. So there are multiple different places on the slide that I kind of want to call out. The main place is here in the middle, the App Volumes Manager. So the App Volumes Manager is a console for management. Uh, it includes all the configuration, the definition of the applications, the integration with your Active Directory. Uh, it's where you set all permissions and entitlements. Uh, it's kind of the heart of the system. The database is probably going to be more of the brains. That's where all of that information is stored. But the app volume manager, along with the database, is what's needed for your organization. So app volumes manager can be made highly available. You can deploy multiple of those pointing at a database instance or an always on availability group for high availability. And uh, you're able to load balance across those servers. So you can make app volumes manager uh, highly available. You'll also notice at the top of the slide, we're talking about Horizon on-prem, not Horizon Cloud. So App Volumes Manager also exists in a hosted version from VMware. That's part of the Horizon Cloud offering. And so you can do that and let VMware handle the high availability, the database, all of those things as a cloud service. The next part that I really want to call out is here at the top in the middle, and that's a virtual machine with the app volumes agent. So it can be a desktop, can be a server OS, but the app volumes agent runs on that image. So this would be part of your master image that you clone your pools and your farms from. Uh, this is the, the main brain for every individual user. So when a user logs into a machine with the app volumes agent, the app volumes agent is going to reach out to the app volumes manager, check with Active Directory, see what they're entitled to, and then it will do one of two things. For traditional app volumes, it will attach those during boot or login. 
And then for apps on demand, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, uh, it will attach icons that can be used by the user. And when the user clicks on the icon, then it will attach the app volume and run the application. So just in time. So two different modes of operation, but that's all orchestrated by the app volume agent. And it's based on who's logging in uh, and who the user is. So you can see that the app volumes agent talks to the app volumes manager. And then based on that, it orchestrates thing on, on the back end with vSphere to attach packages or uh, it attaches VHDs from a share. Uh, that's the primary job of the agent is to help with the attachment of the app volume and make it available to the user. So key design considerations, uh, always use at least two app volume manager servers, you know, preferably behind a load balancer. Uh, the setup does require a shared SQL server. So you can't run the SQL server on one of the app volume managers. That's not a, uh, a great design. So you would want a separate SQL server. Um, app volume instances are bounded by the SQL database. So you can scale out beyond two app volume managers connected to the same SQL database. Uh, there are some guidance around maximum number of connections, maximum number of users. So you follow those uh, guidelines that VMware gives you, and we can certainly help point you to those. Um, but uh, it is best practice to, to have more than one. You can have four pointed to the same SQL database, but an instance is defined by that database instance. So, um, if you need high availability in DR, you may end up with two app volume instances, one in your primary data center with a couple app volume managers and a SQL database, and you may have an entire additional one sitting in your DR site. Um, that depends on your architecture. It depends on um, how, how much you want to go down the, the rabbit hole of protecting uh, this infrastructure. Next key consideration or recommendation is that any kernel mode application should reside in the base image and not in a package. We talked a little bit about this. Antivirus, um, you know, any sort of agents, you know, user experience agents, those kinds of things, we recommend that you put into the base image, not into a package. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You are able to use storage groups. So I mentioned that app volumes create a virtual hard drive, a VHD or a BMDK. Well, if those all exist on the same uh, LUN, on the same storage group, or excuse me, storage device in vCenter, there is a chance that you could have you know, corruption or that that particular uh, VMFS goes down. So storage groups is a concept that lets you aggregate and make copies of the VMDK across multiple different data stores inside of vSphere. Um, there are recommendations about how many users per VMDK. Storage groups let you scale so that you can aggregate the load across multiple different disks on the back end, multiple packages on the back end. We'll talk a little bit more about storage groups as we go through the demo. Storage groups can still help customers even if you're using vSAN. vSAN is completely um, compatible with app volumes. Uh, and so storage groups help with replicating packages in vSAN environments. Um, packages are going to be 100% read. That's one of the benefits here. You've created a package that's immutable. It's not going to change for the application. So all of the things that you're doing with an app volume is 100% read. Uh, they do have the concept of writable volumes. A lot of users choose not to use writable volumes, and we can certainly talk more in depth about that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but there is the concept of writable volumes uh, inside of app volumes as well. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about some sizing limits and recommendations. So based on the number of concurrent logons, um, is where you will basically you know, size and create your architecture and design. So each app volume manager has been tested for 2000 concurrent logins. 
that's at a rate of one per second. Uh, the number of current logins determines, <clears throat> excuse me, the number of app volume managers and the size of CPU and memory for the app volume manager. And uh, it also determines the size of the block, the number of VMs per VM uh, vCenter server. So <clears throat> when we talked about Horizon blocks in Horizon 101, that concept also applies here. So for less than 2,000, we recommend two app volume managers. When you go up to 5,000, we would add a third and then a fourth up to 7,500. And then um, basically scale out from there for every 2,500 users, as you can kind of see in the last column. Um, you also increase the number of CPUs uh, per app volume manager as you increase the number of concurrent logins. And we increase the amount of memory up to 16 gig, uh, gigabytes once we go uh, above 7,500. Now, vCenters per pod, this is a concept from Horizon. If, if pods doesn't sound familiar to you, that's something we can certainly talk more about. But um, we do want to see uh, you know, some scale out uh, per pod based on this architecture as well. So um, up to 2,000 concurrent logons, uh, you know, you've got two vCenters per pod and it scales up to a four plus one for every 2,000. So very similar to what you've got for app volume managers, uh, but because vCenter is involved in attaching the VMDKs, it does have a dependency on, on the vCenter to be able to attach the volumes. Uh, that's why this uh, sizing is, is important as well. So uh, storage limits. I mentioned that you can have packages with a single application or packages with multiple applications mixed together. From a storage limit, VMware recommends no more than eight to 10 packages per VM uh, and up to a thousand users per package. So those storage limits also come into play as you create your design. I'm gonna take a quick break just to grab some water. My throat's getting uh, sore. Are there any questions? Um, about what we've covered so far with app volumes. All right, if there's no questions, let's talk about delivery modes. We covered this a little bit already, but there, yeah, Aubrey, go ahead. You wanna come off mute? No, that was a mistake, sorry. <laughs> okay, no worries at all. All right, so two modes of delivery, classic mode and on-demand. So classic mode, uh, you can take a package, an application, and it gets mounted on the VM, on the computer, at startup or at user login. Those are the two types. And so this makes the application merge with the existing uh, base image, the, the golden master image, and it looks like the application is installed. Even though it lives in a separate VMDK and it's being abstracted by app volumes, it looks like it's there persistently as soon as the user logs in or the computer starts up. But that's not always ideal. You know, I know from my previous life, we bought a lot of companies, and so we had to maintain some of their software for write-off and for you know, seven years and historical reference. So on demand may be a better way of doing that. So for that imaging application, it may only be used twice a month by a user. Well, mounting it every time a user logs in just slows down the login process. It adds overhead to the environment. It's much better to just give the user the icon to launch the imaging application. And then when the user clicks on it, at that point, App Volume Managers attaches the disk, it launches the program, and uh, you save time both during the logon and the user still gets a fast and efficient way to get to this older application. So on-demand application gives you a lot more flexibility. It helps you not bloat uh, the overall environment that you're using. So your farm stays skinnier, you use less resources overall because you're not running things that 
don't need to be there. So classic versus on demand. Here's a quick, um, quick diagram. Um, the package gets attached by the app volumes manager, um, excuse me, by the app volumes agent. The agent talks to the manager, it talks to vCenter, vCenter talks to the host and attaches the VMDK. So the order of operation is basically your user logs in on that virtual machine at the top, they click the icon, uh, and uh, all the orchestration happens. So the attachment is the same. It's just when does it attach that's different. So both classic and on demand use the same workflow. Uh, it's just a matter of when does it actually happen. Now, Horizon can also do published apps on demand. Now, what is that, right? So in a Horizon farm, you have the ability to directly integrate with the app volume manager, and you choose a instant clone farm inside of Horizon as your host farm. So you still have to have a base operating system. You still have to have a farm. But then all of the individual applications that you want to publish are pulled directly from app volumes. And Horizon can make them appear as icons and published apps with a desktopless user experience. So inside of Horizon Manager, it makes it easy. Um, if you're using app volumes with Citrix, you can also do the same thing. Uh, it takes a little more configuration, but you basically publish the app volume agent, and then you add some additional connection information uh, to point it to the right application. And so you're able to use a published app on demand uh, directly integrated and directly published to your Citrix workspace or your Horizon uh, web user interface or the Horizon client. So published apps are extremely easy uh, to make happen. Uh, all you need is just a clean, pristine desktop uh, to run them on, and then Horizon does the rest of the orchestration. Uh, one note, Horizon published apps on demand does require that you're on version 8 release 2212, which was the end of uh, the December of 2022 release. Uh, and you have to have the same 2012, excuse me, 2022 December release of app volumes. Um, that is a newer feature. So do want to point that out. If you've got older versions, you would not see this, but anything later than that, you do have the on-demand capability. Next up, talk a little bit about writable volumes. Um, I mentioned that a lot of cho users choose not to use writable volumes. Um, I will say that uh, where app volumes for published applications and for you know adding applications to your base image works flawlessly, there are a few more gotchas to writable volumes. Uh, in the future, this is technology that may get removed from the product. So. Um, real quickly, I'll cover it, but uh, this is one where um, we should definitely talk more about the future of this technology. <clears throat> Excuse me. Writable volumes are used for persistent uh, data and for user installed applications. That's really where this technology comes into play. So with a writable volume, you can allow a user to come in and you know, add their own Notepad++, add their own utilities, and those installations are redirected to the writable volume. And so over time, as the user moves from non-persistent machine to non-persistent machine, this attaches, reattaches their application and allows them uh, to be able to read and write. That's the critical difference between writable volumes and packages. Packages are going to be read only. We talked about that, 100% read. Writable volumes are going to be read and write. Um, they're often paired with Dynamic Environment Manager or DEM, uh, where DEM can capture and save some of the profile information. Uh, and, and like we talked about, it's primarily used for user installed applications. So packages are stored on either a VMFS data store or a vSAN data store for vSphere clusters. Uh, for AVD and other uh, VHD, they're stored on a SIF share. So uh, app volumes um, 
does support both of those technologies, depending on where your use case is at. Uh, when you create an app volume manager, you choose, is it going to be vSphere integrated or is it going to use uh, VHDs stored on a share? To allow you to get replication and high availability, we use the construct of storage groups. We talked a little bit about this on an earlier slide, but storage groups replicate the packages in writable volumes across multiple VMFS or vSAN data stores. And the app volume manager handles all of this for you. So this present, provides resiliency in a site to protect against VMFS corruptions, uh, you know, LUN problems, maybe a storage array. Uh, it's a great way for you to transition between storage technologies. If you have multiple different storage arrays in a three tier, even multiple different vSANs, uh, you can use this to cluster across those different storage platforms. In a multi-site design, specialable uh, non-attachable non data store is used to replicate data across many sites. So we talked about this. You have multiple V centers to scale, especially in uh, you know DR type situations. You can have two different app volume managers, point them at the same data stores, and then replicate the data across storage groups. So there's two automation options for storage groups. There's automatic replication, and then there's automatic import. So automatic replication is going to make the data move between sites or between uh, at volume instances. Automatic import is going to make it not only replicate, but also appear. And so every change, every package, everything across your at volume environments will get replicated across and be available inside of app volume manager. So for some use cases like DR, you may not want to see those applications. You may only want to see the local applications. Uh, and so you have the choice, replicate only or import and replicate or replicate and import, I guess is the correct order. This is the diagram um, of the non-attachable data store. So in storage group one, you've got data store one and two. Those are replicating the app volumes between both of those. They're pushing all of that data into a non-attachable data store five. App volume manager at site two is looking at data store five and then replicating all of that to data stores three and four. This is the way that we get high availability and resilience. As you can see, we've got load balancers sitting in front of the app volume managers pointed to the same SQL database so that we have a good resilient design. This is, this is a recommended uh, architecture for multi-site uh, with resiliency. If you're in the cloud, and I've got a, a good friend down at a healthcare company in Florida, uh, who pioneered some of this. If you're using Horizon Cloud uh, with app volume managers, you can also use the Azure NetApp files uh, for replication on um, Azure VMware service, Amazon FSX. Uh, so the NetApp files construct is also a, a way of getting high availability across multiple regions in the Azure cloud and uh, also uh, you know the NetApp solution on Amazon is a way to get it for any use cases with your uh, workspaces, workspaces core, and also your um, uh, app stacks inside of Amazon. Scalability, I've hit this many times already, but multiple instances of app volume manager and load balanced. Uh, vCenter servers uh, are a way to achieve load. So you spread the load across multiple vCenter servers to create larger horizon pods, and you can make use of those from app volume manager instances. App volume managers can also use multiple active directory domains. So it can be used across multiple sites with or without a trust configured. So as long as the app volume manager has credentials and can talk to the domain controller, you can use and entitle users across multiple domains. There is a mode where you can use app volume managers without Active Directory. So non-domain joined entities can also access it with a special setting. Uh, you do have to toggle that on inside of app volume manager. 
Uh, but uh, just know that you can actually do this in a non-domain join capacity as well. Your vCenter storage is going to be a major um, factor in the ability to scale out and the ability to provide great performance. So focusing on your storage, how it's used, and what you're able to deliver from an, uh, an overall IOPS performance or IOs per second is a big part of uh, how well app volumes are going to perform in your environment. So we've talked about scalability, just briefly talk over this. I think I've hammered it home by now, but uh, load balancing is the critical part of it. There is not a load balancer in the solution. You're gonna have to bring your own load balancer. Um, you can certainly use uh, F5, Netscaler, uh, A10, Big IP, um, whatever uh, flavor you happen to use in your organization. In terms of database design, I mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, there are a lot of places where a single app volume manager with a local database is probably okay but that's not highly available. And so we never recommend going that route, even for a small, um, a small farm or a small environment. We recommend you have a database server and we recommend at least two app volume managers. Um, with that database server, you, know, you can use failover clustering for high availability. That's the traditional way of doing it using Microsoft clustering technology at the server OS level. The other way to do it is always on availability groups. Um, this is replication built at the Microsoft SQL Server software layer. Uh, it allows SQL Server to handle the replication between itself and one or more other database servers. And um, you know it also handles the failover and the listeners uh, within that as well. So, Somewhat related to failover clustering, but a completely different design at a higher level. Uh, a lot of DBAs recommend uh, or, or like always on availability groups. Um, it is dealer's choice. And our recommendation is that you at least have some, uh, some high availability. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> let's... Uh, Pause here for a minute. I'm going to give everybody a quick 15 or, or 10 minute break, and then we'll come back and do an app volumes demo. Um, I want to take you through the user interface, look everything over, and uh, then we'll uh, dive into Dynamic Environment Manager after that. Um, let's uh, be back here at uh, 1220 Eastern or uh, whatever time it is locally for you here in the next nine minutes. Thanks, everybody.
All right, and we're back. Uh, any questions while we're at this pause? All right, if not, let's drop into a tour of the app volumes manager. So uh, I'll just go ahead and log back out. Uh, it is Active Directory integrated. Um, that is uh, the general uh, way that this is run. Uh, it is possible to deliver to non-AD uh, accounts. So um, uh, we talked a little bit about that. There is a setting in here. Uh, I'll pass down is my local lab environment. Uh, so I'm just going to log in here with my credentials. And as we talked about, there's the concept of applications, packages, programs. Then you see assignments, attachments, and writables. So as we talked about, the application is the big picture. It's the thing that's going to persist long term. If we look at the applications I have here, I've built one for Notepad++. You see that it actually has three packages because I've updated the packages over time. Um, and you see that the current flag is to NPP version 8.5.4. So that's our current version of Notepad++ that is in the environment. So uh, from here, it's easy to assign or unassign um, users to the application. I'll click in, you'll see a little more detail. So the packages are here. If I wanted to revert, to an earlier version, all I have to do is come here to this package, use the set current button, and off we go. Uh, if we're ready to create a new package, you know, because there are some actual updates to Notepad++ since I've packaged this, you can click the update button. It will take the package. You automatically go in, choose storage. You choose your delivery method, or again, classic attached during logon or boot up and on-demand attach when the user clicks the icon. Uh, you set the stage. This is part of the workflow so that you know where this package is at. Any user that comes into the admin console knows where this package is at. And you click update. And actually what I'm going to do is I think it's 8.5.8 .8 is the current version. So I'll just go ahead and create that. Click update. It will create a package in the background, cloning the VMDK uh, of the Notepad++ 8.5.4 package as the basis for that. So that's the applications. You can see all of the different packages for different applications here. Status, are they packaged or unpackaged? Are they enabled, disabled, retired? Um, you can see what dates things were created. Uh, and so you get the ability to kind of from one quick view, see everything that's going on. In terms of programs, these are the executables that are part of the packages that you can point to. And so you can see all the different executables across different packages um, across the entire app volumes environment. Assignments, you can see which packages and applications are targeted out to what Active Directory groups. Um, here, I'm packaging out things that are using the current marker. Uh, so that you can, you know, always use that as part of the workflow so that you know where and what you've got targeted out to your environment. Attachments here, this is going to show you where um, we've got attachments in the environment. So you see that uh, this, um, this IT utils package, which has WinSCP and uh, Putty and a few other utilities is attached to my Horizon Server 1. You also see that Visual Studio Code is attached to Horizon Server 1. So real quickly, you can come in and see what's in use, uh, what packages are, are connected, all of that kind of thing. And lastly, writables. This is for writable volumes. I'm not using that in the lab environment, but this is where I would be able to create writable volumes for user installed applications. And that's the inventory tab. Um, from a directory standpoint, you see all of the different uh, servers and users and groups that are part of the app volumes environment. You can go in and look at individual users. 
computers, groups, OUs, um, and their relationship to the different elements inside of App Volume Manager. So in the group view here, these are all of my Active Directory groups that are used for targeting out different applications. So it's easy for a new administrator to come in here and say, okay, uh, which groups are in use? Go and research that inside of Active Directory. You can drill into and see who uh, has been, or what's been assigned, what writable volumes are associated with it. So uh, compared to Liquidware, you get a lot more dashboard information, troubleshooting information um, with app volumes because of the way that um, VMware has chosen to kind of create the product with a central management console. Next part is the infrastructure tab. You see all the different managed machines uh, that have access and have the agents running. So. I've got it running uh, at volumes for my Parallels environment, Horizon, um, and also for my Citrix environment here in the lab. So uh, as we look at and launch some of these here in just a few minutes, uh, you can see that all of these things are part of uh, my environment and we can show them off. Storage locations, these are all the different LUNs associated with the vCenter or uh, vSphere environment that is hosting for me. Um, and we talked about the concept of storage groups. So I've got a storage group one. It has two, um, two LUNs associated with it. You can see that I can rescan those LUNs, import all the volumes from those LUNs, and you can see that I can replicate here as well. So all of those things, um, fully in your control here uh, inside of the, the app volumes manager. You can see all of the different backend activities. So as you're creating packages, as it's scanning things, all of those go into pending actions. You see all the different jobs that have been run. These are um, automatic jobs, part of the underlying uh, architecture of app volume managers. And you can see that you know it, it refreshes the computers from vCenter, your Active Directory groups. Uh, it looks for expired sessions, cleanups, all of that kind of thing. Uh, and then you have activity, server logs, and troubleshooting to help you with uh, any of those troubleshooting tasks. Last, under configuration, this is going to be your system-wide settings. Um, we have the non-domain entities here. Uh, that's the checkbox that you have to change to be able to allow uh, from an Active Directory standpoint. Uh, you can back up your writable volumes. You've got um, your machine managers. This is where you integrate with vCenter servers. Um, you have your admin roles so that you can assign out admin uh, capabilities to different Active Directory groups. You've got your domain integration. Again, you can have more than one domain inside of App Volume Manager. So you can target it out to multiple dom domains, even if they don't have a trust. Um, and that's the user interface. So as we started down this path, one of the first things that I did was we created a new package here for Notepad++. So. I'm going to stop sharing and, and change to sharing a screen. Give me just one second. All right, I'm going to pull up my Horizon client and move it over to the right screen. So you will see the Horizon client is here, um, a username. And of course, it wants me to download and install and relaunch. So let's do this. We'll go directly to the connection server. Um, and while we're here, what I'll show off is the integration between App Volumes Manager 
and Horizon. So I'll make this a little larger since I'm sharing less of the screen now. So from an application standpoint in Horizon, you are able to add applications directly from App Volume Manager. First step is you go in and actually add an App Volume Manager server inside of your Horizon installation. And once that's registered and talking to one another, you can use this add apps from App Volume Manager. And uh, we're getting a certificate error, um, but you would choose your remote desktop farm and then you would choose the application here and you're able to publish and entitle it directly to users. So as you can see, Excel, FileZilla, all of these applications are already part of my installation for Horizon. So let's log in here. And let's go for Excel. That was the first on the list. You saw that it was a published app volume. The Horizon Farm is going out. It's brokering a connection for me. And then it should present Excel here if everything goes as planned. And sure enough, it appeared here on a, another screen, unfortunately. One second, I'm going to drag it over. And so here's the published Excel application. Now, what we will see if we go back into our app volume manager, we should see an attachment. Let's refresh it. And a dome at the moment. So um, let's go to FileZilla. And here's our FileZilla running. And FileZilla is part of this IT utils that we saw, and it's attached on Horizon Server 1. So that is coming through on here OK. Um, let's see, Firefox. Mm -hmm. We'll try one more. Here's our Firefox. Again, everything wants to launch on another window. We refresh this just to drive home the point. Firefox, the MDK is now loaded on Horizon Server 1 where I'm attached. And so it handles all the orchestration, the attachment, everything automatically on the back end. Now, same is true for Citrix. So I do have Citrix Workspace. And if I look at my applications here, um, where's WinSCP? Let's try this. So in the background, you see that it's waiting on the app volume service, preparing windows. And everything is logged in. What's different here is you see the app delivery and process. This is the app volumes agent running here. It's attaching everything in the background. And so if we go back to our manager and look, now when SCP has been attached to Citrix Server 1, and here is the application running on my screen. So pretty simple from a user standpoint, you're not changing anything. If they're a Citrix user, they click on the icon. If they're a Horizon user, they click on the icon. So everything works very transparently. You're not changing the way that your user works. And so all of those things go towards that great user experience we were talking about at the beginning of today's workshop. All right, so that is the App Volume Manager uh, let's close out of some of these applications. And let's go back to the applications. So during the beginning intro, we looked at Notepad++. We now have four packages. If we click on the packages. You can see I've got eight five 
four, and we just created 858. So walking through um, the next step, you see we created the new package. It was based off of the 5.4 version. Next step is we choose package. We choose a packaging computer. And I believe I have one with PKG in the name. So it is powered down right now, but I would choose that. I'd click package. Then I would remote desktop into that machine. Once I'm logged in, it knows that it's ready for packaging. I install my application. I click done. It collects everything, reboots, log in again. It finishes the collection. And then the package will move from unpackaged to enabled. And so it'll be like this FileZilla new stage enabled, and you'll see the version of the application that's on it. Any questions as we wrap up the demo of App Volume Manager? All right, if not, I'm gonna switch back to our presentation. And let's start talking about Dynamic Environment Manager. So Dynamic Environment Manager is the profile management from VMware. It's included in the Horizon suite. Uh, it does work a little differently than solutions like FS Logix and uh, Liquidware's profile Unity. Uh, DEM is gonna be a little more focused on just capturing user settings not as much around user data. So Dynamic Environment Manager lets you capture those settings from the operating system and applications. Um, it only captures things that are specifically configured by the administrator, does not capture the entire user profile. Um, one thing that is unique to DEM is that you can dynamically apply uh, certain settings when a program is launched. So there are triggers that are based on launch of an application or uh, other things where you, you can inject um, user configuration. So uh, one use case for that is with Adobe Creative Suite. So uh, in a corporate environment, if you're running an Adobe product, everything is cloud, the license has to be dynamically injected and so DEM can handle that with ease. Um, you know, when you launch the Photoshop program, for instance, it can do all of the configuration seamlessly uh, to make it work uh, on every login. The great thing about doing just-in-time dynamic uh, settings is that it reduces the login and logout times because there's less things, less activities that have to happen. So a big part of DEM is making sure that uh, we optimize that login time. I know for me as a traditional Citrix user, that was always a problem is that it takes Citrix a while to load the desktop um, or, or to load an application because you have to go through all of those steps on the back end to pull your data, your user profile, all of those things together. DEM is, is trying to help eliminate those excessive login and logout times. So there's two modes of configuration. There is an Active Directory group policy, and then there's the no AD XML files. So two different ways that you can configure it. Um, you know, traditionally most users have used Active Directory, uh, but you know, I certainly understand there's a lot of folks, a lot of companies moving away from internal AD to Azure AD to more modern management methods. Um, you know, for most VDI environments, we're still talking about AD connected. Um, so I would expect probably 70% of users are going that route. Um, and it's probably less than 30% using the no AD XML route. What platforms are supported with DEM? Well, of course, you've got Horizon. Uh, that comes as no shock. But you can also do CVAD, um, so Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop, and Citrix DAS. You can use it on remote desktop servers, and DEM does also work on physical PCs. So when we talk about app strategy and targeting places uh, across your enterprise, 
this is a great win because uh, you can use the same solution across uh, your entire fleet. Talk a little bit about DEM's components. Um, so the Active Directory Group policy is a mechanism for configuring uh, DEM. Uh, you've got ADMX templates, files that are provided with the product. Um, the no AD mode, uh, you won't need the GPOs, uh, write logons and log off scripts. You can use a simple XML file um, rather than having to go down the group policy route. Your configuration share is a central SMB file share. Uh, it can be re replicated, including replication with DFSR, although I know there are much better replication solutions. Um, but you replicate the uh, XML files across, or, or the configuration files across multiple file servers. And as long as the, the client has uh, access to the share, you're good to go. Uh, these are read only to users. You don't need to allow users to write to these shares. They are dictating configuration only, so no writes are necessary. You have, you've got the profile archive share. Uh, that's going to be storing user profiles and profile backups. Uh, it's used in read and write. Um, that's going to be your, your primary place. Uh, and, and from a performance standpoint, this is where you're going to want to put that file share as close as possible to the computers that are using it. Um, you know, from what I've seen, from what I've experienced, generally you're running VDIs and well-connected data centers. So both of these shares are going to be fully accessible, lots of bandwidth. Uh, but it is important to note that that user profile share has a lot to do with uh, giving good performance to your end user. The Flex Engine is an agent that uh, resides on the virtual desktop or on the RDSH server uh, that's being managed. That Flex Engine agent, again, would be something packaged into your base image uh, alongside the app volumes agent. And so that would be part of the base image and not a, a, an app volume package or something like that. Your flex configuration files, those are going to be files that um, dictate how a particular application or window setting is going to be stored uh, in the system. So Flex Engine uses those flex configuration files to read and store the user information. Uh, when you're creating your DEM environment uh, from a you know, greenfield or, or brownfield sort of aspect. But when you're coming into DEM new, uh, you know, figuring out what to capture is really important. So the application profiler is something you will use to help determine where an application stores configuration data in the registry or in the file system. Um, that's going to be critical to creating your configuration files. And so uh, the application profiler is is helpful uh, when you're trying to to figure out where is this application talking inside of the Windows operating system. There are some support tools. There's a help desk support tool as well as a self service option. Um, you know the help desk support tool lets you reset and restore user settings. Um, it lets the administrator open and edit profile archives. Uh, it lets you an analyze the profile archive sizes. It includes a log viewer. So basic troubleshooting things inside of the help desk support tool. The self-service tool lets users manage and restore their own configuration settings. It is optional. Um, it is uh, not something that I actually see a ton of from a deployment standpoint, but uh, it is an option for you there. Uh, the sync tool is another optional um, component. It is designed to help you support physical PCs that work offline or have limited bandwidth. So if you do run into cases where you've got limited bandwidth uh, and, and you need to be able to pull down these settings locally, your sync tool will help you with that. And then um, last but not least, there is direct flex. That is a feature that provides you the option to import application settings at the application startup instead of user login. We talked a little bit about that. Direct Flex 
allows you to cut down on login times because you're not having to do as much process during the login events. DEM benefits, faster delivery. Uh, really, like I said, it's about, its primary purpose is trying to reduce login times, uh, move things to adjust in time, immediate application, launch type configuration. It's a pretty simple architecture. There's a single share with all the configuration, no database. Uh, it's scalable uh, because there's no shared infrastructure. It can scale up to 100,000 end users. Uh, you can specify particular application settings. You don't have to grab an entire profile. Uh, you don't have to deal with the bloat of storing everything. Um, and then lastly, you can use triggers to do specific things during app launch. So again, uh, app volumes plus uh, DEM gives you a, uh, a really good foundation for improving that user experience. You make it seamless. The user doesn't know they're not on a persistent desktop. They don't know that it's anything different than what they experience on their laptop or desktop at home. And they have this find me, follow me sort of nirvana where they get the applications they need and they get the data that they absolutely require. And on the operational side, you get a better operational experience. It's less complicated. You've got workflow to help you, uh, you know, with application releases, with updates and things like that. And again, the user gets a great experience. So it's a no compromises way to get you to a great user experience with low operational overhead. And again, as we talked about today, this may be in the Horizon platform, but both of these products are licensable and available for other platforms. So Citrix users can benefit from this just as much as Horizon users. Um, you know, regardless of what your VDI uh, strategy is today, uh, these two products could come in and have great opportunity to, to help you innovate. So that brings me to the end of the workshop presentation. So next up is the lab. So I'm going to pause here. Uh, any questions from anyone? All right. If no questions, I'm going to pop in a link for you in chat. If you click this link, this is going to take you out to our hands-on lab or VMware's hands-on labs. And um, from here, you should be able to click the take this lab now. It may ask you to log in. Uh, you do need a customer connect login, a VMware account um, to get into this. Uh, but go ahead and let's click that take this lab now button. And uh, I will just share what it looks like. this over. All right. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. This is the hands-on lab link that I just popped in. You click take this lab now, you'll notice that I already have the lab spun up, but it will load the lab for me here. And this is the user interface for the lab. A couple things that I will go over for you. Once the lab starts, I believe it's good for uh, multiple hours. So this is uh, a good environment for you just to continue to use after today's uh, event. And if you have questions or need uh, to extend the time, hands-on labs are available 24-7 uh, on the VMware website. So it's just hol.vmware.com, and you can find the entire lab catalog out there. Uh, there's this lab on Horizon, but there are lots of additional labs out as well. So definitely taking a little bit extra time. 
A uh, couple things in the user interface. So up here under console actions, you're going to be able to see here in the main space where the cloud is at today, you've got a remote desktop sort of interface into your lab environment. You can send control out, delete, things like that from this menu. Uh, your lab manual is going to be here on the side. So you can see, well, I just moved it to the other side. This button will move it back and forth. You can also pop it out into its own window so you can move it around. Um, but this will be your lab guide. Uh, for today, we're going to be focused on the modules around app volumes and DEM. Um, I believe that is modules, let's see, eight. And unfortunately, I can't see it right now. Okay, here we go. Perfect. So you'll see your remote desktop here on the left side. If you click this uh, icon here at the top of the manual, you will see module number three and four. Um, wait, excuse me, module number four and five and six are the ones that we are focused on for today's lab. So if you want to do at volumes first, go to module five and uh, it will take you through an introduction. Um, and you can use these controls at the top to go through. It talks, you know, a lot of what we did uh, already from an education standpoint, you know, benefits. And then um, you can go in and follow it step by step to look at and work in your own app volumes environment. So I will be here. And I'm going to stop recording now. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in chat, Q&A. Uh, come off of mute and ask. I'll be here and available and uh, monitoring for the rest of our time today. I uh, do appreciate you making time for us. And uh, for everyone re-watching on YouTube, appreciate your time watching this as well. Thanks, everyone.